So taking vows, taking vows is what? Taking vows is a direct antidote to your fear. It is a direct antidote to your hang-up. It's a direct antidote to what you are afraid of. And when you take vows, you don't lose anything. In fact, you gain. Temporal gain and long-term gain. Why? Because when you take vows, A, object, motivation, and the vow taker, the recipient, is very different. If you take vows, if you take vows in front of the law, in, on a law book, and I'm going I'm to be a good lawyer, blah, blah, you break that. Your cohorts and your peers and, and the system and the government lose respect for you, but it's just, it stops at that. But if you take vows in something higher, such as a Buddha, it's not a matter of losing respect. In front of the Buddha, if you offer a candle, you can fulfill your wishes. It, the Buddha has the power to help you to create the merit to fulfill your wishes ultimately and temporarily. Therefore, if you offer something powerful to the, if you offer something to the Buddha with a powerful motivation, then it's very powerful to fulfill one's wishes. Similarly, why do you always have to offer the traditional candle and incense? Why do you have to offer the traditional flowers? Why can't you offer effort? Why can't you offer vows? Why can't you offer something that you feel attached to? Why can't you offer that? If you, in fact, offer that, it will be more beautiful than flowers, more illuminating than, than candles, much more, and smell much better than incense. Do you think the Buddha became a Buddha and worked so hard, three aeons of meditation, giving his body, taking vows, and holding on his practice, and becoming a fully awakened being, do you think he did all that so he can sit there and get incense and candles? Do you think he did that for that? Well, that's all, we're, that's all we're offering Buddha. Right now, at our level, at our level, all we're offering every day is incense, candles, some flowers, some water, some mandalas. That's all we're offering. We're not offering what Buddha really would like you to offer. What is that? Your practice. When you offer Buddha your practice, who gets the benefit? you yourself get the benefit. Why? You will see, start seeing a transformation. When you see that transformation and you offer up that to the Buddha, actually you're offering the two types of Buddhas. The ultimate Buddha and the external Buddha. The external Buddha is Lord Buddha. The internal Buddha is your Buddha potential. You open it up even more. So when you, when you make that offering to the Buddha, you, offer, you open up your internal or secret potential, your Buddha nature mind. And at the same time, you offer to the external Buddha. When you offer to the external Buddha, the merits collected from that will be the manure for your crops to grow. What does that mean? When you make external offerings to the three jewels, the merits you collect, when you actually do the meditations, when you actually do the practices, you will gain the results. Why? Simply engaging in practices will not gain results because you need merit. So therefore, when you make external offerings to the Buddha, when you make external offerings, you collect that merit. Then you're making internal offerings to your, the Buddha inside of you, which is your potential. So therefore, when you take vows, it is very, very powerful, direct Dharma practice. Why is that? Because A, you're giving up your fears. B, you're accustoming yourself acclimatizing yourself to a new mode of thinking and a new freedom. Because we feel when we take vows, we lose freedom. You gain freedom by taking vows. How can you lose freedom by doing virtuous work? How can you lose freedom by doing virtuous work? In fact, you gain freedom. You gain respect. You gain love. You gain happiness. You gain help. And you gain companionship from engaging in positive actions. And at the same time, at the same time, you make an offering to your internal Buddha. That internal Buddha is you, the I, Da. At this moment, contaminated. But the contamination can be removed. And that I becomes enlightened. That I becomes enlightened being. And how do you make that I enlightened? By bringing its true nature out. How do you bring its true nature out? You bring its true nature out by acting 
in ways that bring its true nature out. So at this time, if we need vows to restrict us or to help us or to guide us to find our Buddha nature, that is the purpose of the vow. So therefore, when we take the vows, inverted commas, please, it restricts us from doing actions that increase attachment and desire and anger and increases actions that help us to discover the opposite of those negative qualities. So therefore, when we take the vows, when we take the vows, it is not an external vow. It is words of truth. It is something that is natural within us. How do you know it's natural? Let me give you, let me give you proof. When someone smiles at you, how do you feel? When someone helps you when you're in trouble, how do you feel? When someone gives you food, how do you feel? When, someone, when you fall, someone picks you up, how do you feel? If you feel good, then that's a natural state of mind. How do you know it's a natural state of mind when your mind feels good about it? I mean, unless you're, you know, a serial killer, oh, I feel really good when the blood is gushing out. When I slice their neck and it's gushing out, I feel good. No, no, you don't look at sickos and psychos like that. I'm talking about us, normal people. I know all of you are thinking, which one of us is normal? Rajasar is looking, who, who are? Who, who's normal? Nobody up there, love. So, what's my point? My point is, how do you know it's natural when you do it and you feel good and the other person feels good? That's natural. That's your natural state of mind. So hence, hence, my point, when we take vows, it looks like we're being restricted. We're not. And anyways, why would you want to do negative things to harm other people that bring you negative results anyway? Why? So if you take vows, you're afraid of that? No. In fact, you should be afraid of not taking vows. Why? Also, another good point about taking vows is it helps you to create awareness. Then you think, oh, I swore in front of the Buddha, my refuge. I swore in front of the Buddha, the one I trust. I trust no one in this world. Actually, for me, I trust no one, just the Buddha. I trust no one. I trust in no one's methods. I only trust in Buddha's methods, the Dharma. Therefore, I trust in Buddha. I trust in Buddha's methods. And I trust in Buddha's servants, the Sangha, the real Sangha. I'm not talking about half past six Sangha who walk around the center pretending with, like peacocks thinking they're attained. I'm talking about real Sangha. I take refuge in the Sangha because they can never lead me wrong. And anybody else below that, anybody else below that who lead me wrong, I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be anything. Why? It's expected of them. That's their nature. So therefore, because I trust the Buddha, I wish to achieve that state. And I trust that what he teaches me, the Dharma, helps me to find liberation. Do you know what liberation means? Liberation just doesn't mean enlightenment. Liberation can be right now. And that is to be free of the fear of the results of negative karma and negative actions. How do you become free from that? You don't do it. You don't do it. How do you not do it? In the beginning, maybe you can do it by sheer will. But if you have vows, it's even better. Because vows create awareness in your mind. In the beginning, it's a little difficult. But it becomes easier and easier and easier with time. And it becomes natural. Like I said, in future, this life and future lives, you don't even need vows. It becomes procedural. You naturally are already habituated in your new way of, your new mode of benefiting others, new mode of existence, which is not harming others. That's why in Tibet, they revere reincarnated lamas so much. They believe that they come back with natural good intention. They come back with natural good mind and natural good practice. I'm not referring to myself, although it's going to look like it. I'm telling you in general. That's why they revere on that basis, is that these people have trained themselves for many lifetimes, and they come back. So whatever they do, whether it looks good, looks bad, looks black, looks white, we trust them. Why? They have methods that are beyond this world, due to many lifetimes of practice. We have that confidence in Tibet. And they have proven themselves beyond a doubt many times. So in Tibet, disrespecting a Rinpoche, a real reincarnated Lama, not one with a title, not a person with a title in this life, but a real Rinpoche, many lifetimes of practice, a real Lama, it's considered very detrimental. Why? One of the vows of the Mahayana vows is not to degrade, denigrate, or hurt, or harm, or say negative things against a Bodhisattva. There are 10 levels of Bodhisattva, not only Kuan Yin. So when we have doubt, when we say negative things, if we take sides against the Bodhisattva, well, ordinary person saying negative things, we take sides against the Bodhisattva, the action is very detrimental. How is that detrimental in the future when you come in the presence of a Bodhisattva? You will not be able to perceive it's a Bodhisattva. You cannot perceive. Not at all. 
you will always see that person as an ordinary person. Always you view that person as wrong, ordinary, or doing wrong things. It's very dangerous. That's why we train with Guru Devotion. In Guru Devotion, we try to view the Guru as pure. Whether the Guru is pure or not is not the point. We try to view the Guru as pure in order to develop pure view. When we develop pure view, our whole reality changes. It is said that when we take the vows at the most auspicious day, I can't give you a full explanation of what auspicious means. If Buddha chose tomorrow to enact his virtuous deeds, then tomorrow must be an excellent day of doing virtuous deeds. So if we do virtuous deeds on a virtuous day chosen by an enlightened being, then the deeds is multiplied greatly. Thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And hence that's why we take vows on special auspicious days. One of them is Vesak Day. It can be Lama Tsongkhapa's birthday. It can be, um, uh, it can, it can be any saint's holiday or whatever. All right? And that's one thing. And the second thing is it collects a great amount of, of uh, positive potential and merit in a short time. Why is that? Why, 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 why? Because most of us in this room don't do things that are in the vows anyways. Most of us in this room don't do a lot of these things in these vows that we're not supposed to do. But simply not doing it doesn't collect any good merit. doesn't collect anything, nothing. Nothing at all. Rabbits don't kill. doesn't mean they collect the merit of not killing. Collecting and not killing is having a long life a good body, pleasant appearance, and being born in places where what you need and what you want will come to you with no problems, and continuously. So therefore, not killing has a lot of direct and indirect results. So a rabbit doesn't kill, doesn't mean, doesn't mean that he, the rabbit's collecting positive karma. A retarded person in a wheelchair that doesn't know anything, that's blind and deaf, I'm sorry to use that example. A mentally uh, challenged person, who is in that situation. I'm sorry to use that as an example, that um, they don't do these kind of actions doesn't mean they're collecting good karma. It's neutral, it's nothing. So similarly, not engaging in the action does not mean you are not collecting good or bad karma. Similarly, a young child, an infant, doesn't kill, doesn't steal, doesn't lie, doesn't commit sexual misconduct, doesn't wear perfume, doesn't wear jewelry, doesn't have affairs, nothing. But that doesn't mean the baby is collecting positive karma. You don't go, oh, baby, namo amitofo. Right? I mean, use your brain. Do you, who goes up to a baby and goes, we told for. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't lie, you're a saint, put them on a throne, worship them every day. Which, which, who, who does that to a kid? Nobody, right? Since nobody does that to a kid, that tells you that not doing it doesn't mean you're collecting virtuous karma. I'm giving you logic now. I'm giving you logic to think. I'm giving you debate to think. I'm giving you food for you to think carefully through and through. So therefore, not when you take the vow and you're already not doing these actions, then you're collecting merit. Oh, it's very powerful. 